I can really mess things up with that, buddy. <laughs> okay. All right. Good talk. Oh, we yes. Give me all, all the power. The we, are, we, are, we are now recording for whatever <laughs> opening this is going to be. Oh, about talking about throwing the switches? Yes. Yeah, throw the, throw switch. the switch, Eagler. Um, making, making, my, making my way downtown. Who is that? That is Vanessa Carlton. Vanessa, Vanessa Carlton. Yes. I know my, like, she is yeah. the business. I enjoy Vanessa Carlton. As just I only know artist. that one song, and that's why like, I knew like the whole thing where I started singing it. Oh, it's Who the Michelle Branch. Michelle Branch is I I know her I think from let me check this out real quick. Michelle Michelle Branch is a thousand miles with her and and Vanessa Carlton. Oh, I agree. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So they 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 who originally sang it was um, Vanessa Carlton, but Michelle Branch also did. Um, it with her so michelle branch did that um but yeah there's a, like a like there's a michelle branch versus vanessa carlton like quiz like what's interesting is is that i don't what has vanessa carlton been up to le- recently don't i'm not sure I she's care. too busy walking up you know <laughs> walking downtown and making her way downtown <laughs> walking fast <laughs> Vanessa carlton face is passed and she's home down vanessa you know, carlton you know. okay all right all right i'm sorry i this wow. stuff sticks in my brain and i can't get it out uh, Vanessa Carlton is 41 years old, if you can believe it. Uh, she has her release. She released her fifth studio album, Lieberman, Lieber, Lieberman, whatever that is, in 2015. So she has not put anything out recently. Um, she was finished recording a new album in 2014, 2015. She wow. signed with another record company. She released the album in 2016, and then in 2017, earlier things live. Um, but that's really it. She's been doing a lot of cover songs apparently since 2017. She's had a Broadway debut. Okay. She'd be taking over the lead role in the Carol King musical Beautiful in 2019. Um, oh, here we go. Vanessa's sixth album, Love is an Art, was released on March 27th, 2020, revealed via Twitter. So there you go. We now wow. know more than we needed to ever know. So the about, last decade yeah. of Vanessa Carlton is right there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome to Nerds by Screenlight, where we're talking about Vanessa Carlton and Michelle Branch. No, well, think this started out with like pump up the volume, pump, pump up, up the, the volume, volume. <laughs> dance, dance. That's like I'm in me just singing that along because we're talking about turning up the volume. Which also, pump up the volume is a uh, solid '80s hit yep. with Christian yeah. Slater. Yes. Oh, and oh, movie, six, movie, '80s movie. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon using Christian Slater. Christian Slater was in Star Trek Undiscovered Country yes, as an officer was. on the USS Excelsior. He and, absolutely was. And he was in the door frame getting Captain... Getting oh, No, not, not Captain Sulu. It was the uh, Captain Harriman. He okay. was alerting Captain Harriman. Or no, it was Sulu, wasn't it? Oh, I got to figure this out. Oh, see, now this is rabbit hole time. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. That's why I like... I, 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 like, I like that the Trekkies can claim Christian Slater. Um he was in Star Trek nine uh He's well, ours. He's, why would we want to claim him. why would Trekkies want to claim Christian Slater? Because he's awesome. He is kinda awesome. You know? He is kinda awesome. I do I do Maybe like him and Mr. Robot so they can as reach well. Reach out to Kevin Bacon. Nineteen ninety one, he was um yeah, he wa- he awakens Captain Sulu in his quarters. Yep, I remember that scene. And Christian Slater has a particular kind of voice. Mm-hmm. So you knew it, it was him, even yeah. though he was kind of in shadow. Yeah, yeah. You could be like, ah, no, you still knew he was there because yeah. you can see his face. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But now, You're not going to cut me. out the moneymaker. Yeah. That's correct me if I'm wrong. The yeah. alert was on the attack against yeah. the Klingons. Is yeah. that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was Pink like, blood. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep. And okay. he apparently, according to Digital Digital Spy, Christian Slater stole the costume from his Star Trek V, um, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country cameo. So that's a bit, nice. of, a bit of news. I mean, if I could a snag fan. my costume like yeah, that, I would too. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Mine. I have one of those costumes from the Star Trek The Experience in Las Vegas that closed down like 10 years ago, and I ordered it back in the day when it was still around. Nice. Well, there you go. That's our intro. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Nothing to do with Dune at all, but here we are, hanging out on a Saturday, getting ready. I know, right? Walking downtown <laughs> a thousand miles. <laughs> I've, I, as usual, will have nothing to add here. <laughs> and on that delightful bombshell. Well, you remembered some of the names here, sir. You were in part of this mix. We'll be I, right. This is such we'll, a horrible we'll, start. We'll Why? <laughs> Why funny. didn't it's we okay. just lead with it's, this? It's the best start ever. <laughs> oh, man. Just, you know, just go with it. All right, we'll be back here after the intro. We'll get started with the real good stuff uh, where we will dig into the over 800 page book known as Dune. Stick around. Hold on. Here comes the intro. Get nerdy with me. Talk nerdy to me. Get nerdy with me. All I really need for you to do is just please. I 
it. So. Are you recording right now? I'm recording now. Yeah, we're recording now. <laughs> Dallas is looking at both I'm of editing. us. No, no, no. I'm editing myself because I almost <laughs> dropped that bomb right there. Because <laughs> both of them, both of you two are voracious readers and I can't do that. Yeah. Right. So I'm jealous. <laughs> well, here's the thing. So I we were both talking about how, like... And Dallas was saying, "How you know? How much did you get into the book?" Yeah, and we both said, "Well, we finished it." And yeah. Dallas was like, "What?" And because Dallas was expressing I don't read that fast, yeah, Dallas is not a, is not a fast reader, and there's no shame in that. As a language yeah, arts teacher, I'm telling you right now, I have I had I had kids in sixth grade, I have kids in high school, like they read at different speeds. Now, I of the three of us, I think I'm the faster reader of all three at the moment. Yeah, because I can I can I can get through a book pretty quickly. Um, I did Dune in like three days. That's good. Yeah, three days. I am. I, fa- I read fast. When? <laughs> I read when? Over Christmas break, I, I we went we went to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I I picked up some books and I picked up Dune and I literally. See, it's also the amount of free time he had to do that. Yeah, I rocked through that. Helps three days. I mean, I didn't do it all. Like I, I did, t- 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 took some breaks, but I read the whole book in three days. Okay, yeah. so there's a book that I loaned James not too long ago called Seven Eves. Seven Eves. Yeah, it's, I just uh, I just started it today. It is. It's like eight hundred some odd pages. Mm-hmm. So what you're just gonna watch me? See it how far took it me. It took me a, what was I doing? I was doing maybe, I think it was like trying to do 30 pages a day. Okay. So doing 30 pages a day, what's, I don't know, a month and a half. Month and a half okay. is what it took me probably okay. to do, get that done. And okay. I read that in an hour while sitting at Zazzy, but that's whatever. Well, and I think it's in, I 30 think, pages. <laughs> yeah, I did. In an hour? Yeah. Well, it depends. I was getting distracted by Julia, talking to her a lot and you a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like I it, just started it. And it, it also depends on on kind of what the interest, how mm-hmm. interested am I in the book, right. and mm-hmm. how how fast do I want to listen to the book narrate to me? Because I will read, I read to the point, mm-hmm. well, I read like narration goes. Yeah, I read okay. like, I got to hear it in yeah, my yeah, head. Yeah. yeah. So well, I, I think it also way. like narrative flow. How good is this author with yeah. making it so the book moves smoothly from yeah. section to section? All that kind of stuff because that's really, really important. Yeah, right. Because I mean, you can have some authors that are like, yeah, they're a good author, but the way they just deliver chunks of information and they, yeah. it doesn't flow, and it feels like you're torturing yourself trying to read this book. Yeah, that I understand. Yeah. So we have we have we're doing something different today for the first time in our in our episodes. I think are we on episode ten? Is this our tenth episode? I think so. This is either nine or ten. I think it's our tenth episode, which is kind of exciting because we didn't plan on going two episodes on returns. Yes. So that's kind of like correct. But so we just got so into that one, we just kept going. Yep. That was fun. We did. And so we episode 10 will drop is the previous episode here. Um, and so, yeah. it. Ep- oh, no. This is actually episode 11. Wow. Because episode 10 was the Batman Returns Deep Dive Part 2. Oh, yeah. And we split up. So we have actually hit 11 complete episodes with this one in the tank. Wow. Which is really exciting. A I'm lot of podcasts of don't. Yeah, me too. A lot of podcasts don't make it out of like the five episode streak. Or they become so belabored that the hosts just get hated. They hate it and they don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. We it's too much got, work or yeah. whatever. <laughs> we haven't gotten to that point yet. I mean, remember, we're going to hit our stride at what, episode 46? 40, 46. There according according well, to the 42. ghost. 42. <laughs> or would be 42 or 46. 42, 40, 42 for the Douglas Adams and then 40, 46 <laughs> for the, the afterlife reference. So we're doing something unusual today in that we're taking on a book for the first time in our podcast episode series. Mm-hmm. The book is Dune by Frank Herbert. It is a massive world. With is, how many books? How many books are in that series? Like nineteen. 10, Nineteen. Because you have to consider the books that his son did afterwards right. from his fast. notes. Yeah. Oy. Yeah. That's a lot. That is a lot. Well, it's 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 on a similar scale, um, book wise, not length wise, um, as the Jim Butcher um, Harry Dresden series. Yeah. Because the Harry Dresden series is upwards of 20, 25 books or something like that. Yeah. You don't know who Harry? Do you know Harry Dresden? Oh. God, I got nothing. Harry Dresden. I'm not a. Mm, you're I'm not, not a voracious reader. Well, I, you don't have to be a voracious reader. Yeah. Did, I, Harry Dresden novels are pretty good, but yeah. I think they like you get tired of them pretty quick because they follow the same. How dare you? They sir. follow the same formula, and you know this. How no, I He's don't. Yelling into his mic this. again. How dare you, sir? <laughs> uh, the scene. I'm I'm gonna reference a scene of what I'm about to say in the Blues Brothers movie, which is an amazing movie. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, swer- that movie is great. <laughs> we're swerving around a little bit, but in the Blues Brothers movie, there's a scene where the L, the the two brothers show up. At one of their bandmates' um, 
restaurants, but he works with his wife. And he goes in there, and they're saying things, and they're talking to Aretha Franklin, who mm-hmm. plays the, the wife and the owner of the place. And he says something, and she says, don't you blaspheme in here. Yeah. Don't you blaspheme in here. That's my response to you about Jim Butcher and oh, the Harry Dresden series. Don't you blaspheme in here. Don't you blaspheme in here. Oh. Jim Butcher is a god among men. No. How dare you? No. How dare you, sir? Follows the same old trope in every, same pattern in every single one of those books. And as a literal teacher, literary, literary teacher, literature teacher, you know better. I know better, but I don't care. I reject your I mean, reality. Look, I will and admit, my own. they are fun. Nice. Yes. But it's kind of like, I got tired of it because it's like, I could just start predicting it. It's like, okay, I already you know what's going to happen. I well, see. Okay. I love and it. It's, I don't like that. So it, It's Harry Potter set in an adult writer, adult novel world. Yeah. Um, so it's it's definitely different. I like it just because the characters are engaging and the way that Jim Butcher writes is... I was actually really proud of him to bring in Faye, too. Which yes. Is a lot, not a lot of people in, in Northern America actually touch upon the fairy world yep. stuff. So. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He Brings in May right. and he, or Mave and all these and mm-hmm. it's it and the vampires are in there and all this crazy cool stuff. Um, it's and a lot classic of classic werewolves, which are great. Where it's like yeah. only ancestral. So oh really? Could damage yeah. you. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So there's a lot. There's a lot of mythology deep within that series. He also wrote um, the Codex Alera series, which is like a five book series. It's very very fantasy oriented, very magic ish. Like they have earth powers and water powers and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's if you haven't read it, it is a fantastic book series. Okay. It's really good. I and have like a. 12 book tall pile I need to get to <laughs> Oh so first. do I. Oh so do I. I, yeah. I readily I readily admit to having too much to read. Speaking of too much to read, if you're start thinking about starting Dune, be forewarned. It's the p- 8 866 for that uh, version. The paperback version is let's see if you were correct. The afterword, of course. Let's see. Eight, I don't think it counted the afterword. I have count. the same I have eight, the same version as you do and I bought it Specifically because oh, you go. mentioned it, and it is on the list of things to read, right. and terminology. It, it's waiting. It okay. sits and waits. So for so clarification last... for everybody listening, I've not read oh, this. There's book. an appendix. See, this... my hardback collector's edition is 603 pages. So the end, the and last I'm not counting the appendix, the last page <laughs> of the novel that has story to it um, is page 794. So there's 794 pages right. in the paperback version. Um, it's a beast. Small I mean, print. Yeah, small print. It's it's a beast. I. So we're going to talk about Dune today. We uh, we readily accept that we have not done a book in the 11th. This yeah, is our, so I'm, forgive us our trespasses <laughs> here, folks. Like I, We've never done a book. To so. borrow that theology, theological intent or yeah. theological meaning. So we're going to ask for some mercy and grace as we kind of navigate this and talk about this. Um, Dallas is here, and he's seen the movie. So the original. Oh, yeah, the 1980s original yep. movie. Which is very good, right? Yeah, I like Still it very good. Was. Which has been long hailed as one uh, one it's, of the it's, it's, one of the better adaptations. The solid solid sci fi. Even though critics like tanked it bad, but in the it, fan it, base, they loved it. I yeah, mean, right. Yeah. Now my understanding is it's fairly accurate to the book too. Yeah, so, he he did as close as he could. Yeah. So given what I mean, given the time, given given the again special effects that you have yeah, available to every, you, like the limitations he had. Yeah. Pretty good, and you actually had like a surprise. Like, I love this. Here's Sting. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I love. I, yes, very much. That so. cracked me up, and then it's like the imagery they went for was really great in that movie, mm-hmm. for as clunky and kind of weird it was. It's like this is great, and then there's all, like it wasn't even the first attempt. It was Jodorowsky's Dune was the first attempt, but the, because of the budget issues, they couldn't go through with it. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, there was someone that was doing the Dune movie first. His name was, like, yeah. Jodorowsky, whatever. They do have a lot of, like, concept artwork, and there's some, like, props and stuff, though, for what he was doing. Yeah. But it's like his budget just kept growing and growing and growing and yeah, going yeah, out of yeah. control. So they yanked the whole plug on the whole project. Oh, jeez. And then it went to uh, Lynch's Dune. Okay. I have not seen the new one, which I know I've been told. But here's the thing about the new one is it stops halfway through. It's a halfway point in the book. Yeah. Like, it, there is a part two is in production. In and this book. Yeah. Yes. This book that we're talking about right now, yeah. for those who are not watching me point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Correct. I'm not on film right now. <laughs> yeah, and it's you like a halfway point me. in the book. Because it was originally serialized and broken up into three chunks. Right. And if you, like, some of the, the, the book versions of it will actually yeah. have those parts, like, marked off. Oh, okay. So you'll have like a part one, part two, like my collector's version. To actually, like if I go to the pages, you can see like just a blank page, and I'll say like Moadib, which is like the second part was called uh, that and all that okay. kind of stuff. Gotcha. Okay. It's very nice. So yeah, it depends on which version you got. Right. But yeah, they'll they'll have those like kind of showing like mm-hmm. this is how it was kind of originally released. Here's the first chunk. Here's the third chunk. Here's yeah, the third yeah, chunk. yeah. Well, so the book. So there's the book. There is the movie from the '80s. 
There is also, if you didn't know, several video games. Mm-hmm. The original in 1999 was ported to the PlayStation in 99, but it came out in 98 from our friends at Westwood Studios who Ooh. originated mm-hmm. Command & Conquer. Yes, they did. And all of that. So they created a Dune game. And to this day, it is a beloved video game. Dune 2000 is adored. Um, in, Westwood Studios was a very good studio for yeah. video games, by the way. Yeah, and actually, I'm, my mistake. So here's the deal. I'm I'm mixing up my metaphors here. So Dune, the original video game, came out in 1992. Okay. I should I should be I should be more specific here, and it was developed by Cryo Interactive and all that stuff. Then there was Dune Two, which was also put which was then put out in 92 by Westwood Studios. Okay. So Dune Two came in in 92, and then Dune 2000 came in 98. And then there actually apparently was Emperor the Battle for Dune that came out, was also put out by Westwood Studios. So there's a whole game series that of Dune, the game series, that I have never seen. I well, you got me because I've never played any of those video games. I wasn't aware they existed, really. I wonder... Didn't play them, knew they existed. I knew they existed. The The original Dune has been like really, really praised. Well, I mean, because you also had these sci-fi TV miniseries that did Dune and then they combined Dune and they did well they did Dune and they did Children of Dune those two books but they covered enough material where they did cover that second book right which a lot of people were upset about which we'll get into that later but it's kind of like yeah it covers that whole section there but they never went further they were supposed to go further but they didn't yeah I don't know what happened in production or whatever that killed it I unfortunately didn't get to look that up in like my research for that and then we of course we had our, our recent movie which was actually pretty good I liked it this so is I'm the Dennis I'm lo- Villeneuve. Yeah, I'm looking. I at, love his movies. I'm looking at the, at the games, and there's not they're they're on the wish list on Good Old Games on GOG.com, <laughs> but they're not they're not actually listed for sale. So I'm sure if you I'm sure if you looked for alternate means, you could find it. But I am not going to do that on the podcast right now. I'll do yeah. that at some point. But I will recommend GOG to anybody out there that likes older video games yep. and are curious about some of those old video games. And they video work. Games. Yeah, they, they work, work great. a lot better than they do on Steam. I've been I've been told multiple times by people that if you're looking for an older game, go for Good old GOG um, SWAT three the game the three D SWAT video game that's actually workable on GOG and not on Steam so that's I discovered that originally on what system it was on PC SWAT three mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and then SWAT four I think as well oh wow yeah these are those okay. now SWAT one and two were not three D they were like over the top like clickers and you yeah. clicked the police officers around and you did things okay so let's swing back into Doom let's let's dance back on to the the dusty the dusty planet where spice rules and all the things. I like this book. Oh, I love this book. It is, it is the the mythology of how the the houses are built mm-hmm. and the mythology of how each how how the political system is so intriguing and so weird. Yeah, like you can be living on Caladan, which is a beautiful ocean land, a yep. beautiful like Earth-like planet. And all of a sudden, because the emperor and whatever political machinations are going on, well, you no longer are in charge of that planet as a family. You're now getting to go be in charge of the planet Doom. Well, it had, there's a, there's, I think it was, was it Brian? I don't know if it was, it was Frank got into it in the later books or it was Brian mm-hmm. that wrote about it, where there's a complex series of, there's the Lansrad, which is like one version of like feudal mm-hmm. society. And then you had the Chong Company. Yeah. Which is kind of like a capitalist system that kind of runs everything and makes yeah. everybody their money. Yeah. And the emperor kind of like sits on kind of like the top of them both. Yeah. But in, within it, the different houses have different control of certain like percentages of everything. Mm-hmm. So that's how the Atreides got pushed into Arrakis. Right. Because he was like doing the, the had like, I guess you can call it like controlled warfare. Right. In their system. Yeah. And, the Leto and his his father, they didn't really talk much about Leto, Leto's father, the, the first Duke. They call him the old Duke. Yeah. Were champions yeah. at playing that game yeah. and conquering other people's territories and mm. everything else. But politically and legally, the Harkonnens, with the help of House Carino, who's the emperor's house, yeah. kind of backed them into a corner and was able to shove them into Arrakis, which they could use for their uh, trap. Oh, okay. There's actually a book that explains all this. I just don't remember which one it is. But... <laughs> 
in, oh, in with, with the, 19 that, books, I'm not surprised. That is working in the background of the start of this book. You don't right. see it, yeah. and they don't go too deep into it. Right. I mean, they touch on it a little bit, so you yeah. kind of know why they're being forced off of Caladan. Right. But yeah, that's what's happening here is the Emperor and Baron Harkonnen kind of like shaking hands and being like, yeah, we don't want this guy around very long. Right. Well, and it is later on in the book, it is hinted that this was there, that this that this was a trap and this yeah. that that they were they were hopeful that it would just wipe out this family and that they would be able to take them away and 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 remove them from the from the from the equation yeah. of all of this cuz he's just too good right the problem with that is that his goodness is what earns him the following oh, of yeah. the people on dune of the free people and his understanding of how things should be run um, it's because Leto's the, the father. Yes. And, Duke Leto Atreides. Yep. Duke, and he like out of all of them, out of all the characters, he's the one that you kind of go, okay, yeah, he's, he's good people. Like we yes. like him. He is our hero. Yeah. They talk about, he leads through loyalty, honor, and love for yep. his people. Yeah. Which is like, they, they kind of do a good thing where they kind of point out, I was like, this is unique yeah. in this and it's part of existence? why they want to get rid of him because yeah. he's just, like you said, he is just too good. Oh, well, yeah. It's also because his people are fanatical followers of his. As yeah. soon as he earns their trust, they're like, I'm with him 100% of the right. way. Because he treats us right. He, supply, he, he he helps us. He is the guy who backs us up and is is there for us. And so as they're moving to Dune, and there's it's a, tr- it's a hard transition because, and what we what I didn't know, because I, but as I read is, so the spice is a major economic player. Yes. In the in the universe, mm-hmm. in the world, it is it is the economic almost the economic heart of the empire, and the yes. only place that the spice is available is on Doom. Yes. And they have to be able to mine it, and there's like there's gigantic worms that can, and that's like the epitomous image you've probably seen in the Dune trailers for the movie. Yeah, everybody's probably seen those pictures of the giant thing coming out of the sand with yeah, the giant whole mouth yeah. filled with teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's so much complications there, but because what well, and it's interesting, the spice is almost like a drug. Yes, it is a drug. And yes, very much it's so. A, they call it, it's actually, they reference it once in the book where they actually call it, it's a poison. Yeah, because once you take it or once you have it. A certain concentration is inside of you. You have to keep it. It now becomes it. a part of you. And yeah. so it, it is, and it's an interesting dynamic because I kind of looked at that and I said, so, you know, when the, when the, when the family, when Leto's family moves to Dune, the minute they land, they're done for. Yeah. Like they can't leave or if they leave, they're going to have to get a supply of spice to them wherever they end up going. If they, if they manage to, to be successful on Dune and if they take over another planet, they're going to have to have those supplies. Yeah. It was just one of those things. Once you're there for a certain chunk of time, yep. then you can never go without again. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, then not immediately when they land, but it's like, if we're going to stay here for a long time, yep. we're trapped here. Yeah. Now, or at least our connection to the spice has to always exist. Right. Which I think is an interesting tent. There's a, there's a there's a tense, there's a what's the word I'm looking for. There's a tension there, because it's not a negotiable. There's not a cure. Like you can't be like, oh, I'll take I'll take some medicine and it will stave off the effects. It's not. There's no negotiation. Yeah. With the spice. And what I love about that world building is, because uh, a lot a lot of author, authors will do is to make it easier on themselves. Be like, oh, well, you just you drink this or you take this and yeah. it, it puts off the effect. In Dune, there is no fix. There is yeah. no relief. There is no, oh, well, you know, you just concentrate and meditate and it all gets better and here's your MacGuffin. Yeah, no. It's like, no, this is your thing for the rest of your life. Yep. And that's the power of, of the spice. Well, I mean, it's kind of like there's more into it. Like, you want a space travel? Yeah. Well, no, okay. There's levels of space travel. You want the best form of space travel? Well, yeah. we have a guild of people that yeah. are like kind of super addicted to the spice mm-hmm. that can do space travel the fastest, most efficient method. Yeah. That's a spacing guild. Yeah. There is slower forms of space travel. Yeah. They don't really do much with it. They don't talk about it too much, but yeah. it does exist. Yeah. Because they moved around before the spacing guild was mm-hmm. formed uh, between all these planets. But it's kind of one of those things, yeah, the spacing guild with its ability to take spice, yeah. which is, so they're massively connected to it. And they're, right. the spacing guild is its own separate thing away from everybody else. Yep. Everybody kind of pays homage to them, pays them tons of money. They control space, kind of. You want to mm-hmm. move between planets? Yep. You got to give me some money. Yep. But they, in turn, when you're like, we need spice. Yeah. Who's got spice? Here, take our money. Yeah. So. And it, so it's interesting, like the dynamics, they're very... As, as strong as the politics are and as strong as the economy is, it's heavily dependent on the Dune planet producing this resource. Well, I mean, and that's how we get our end. 
Yeah. And that's and that like the the at the end of the book in the far end the emperor arrives and all hell breaks loose with the war and the shield feet like it is the the end like it's it's a fun ride in Late this book. Spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah. Spoiler. Alert. <laughs> Sorry. Book's been out for how many years now? A long time. I don't even know when it was first published. Again, I still haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but you've seen the movie from the eighties. I've seen the movie from you've the seen 80s. the movie from the eighties. Um, so it is it is like. And the the power of Frank Herbert and how he writes this is copyright nineteen sixty five. Oof, sixty five. How that makes it how old now? For fifty five years old. Yeah, fifty some odd years. Fifty seven. Jeez. So here's the cool thing about Dune is for a long time, and this will circle back to the movie from the eighties and the movie today. Dune for the longest time was just a cool sci-fi thing. Like, oh, have you read Dune? Oh, that's really nerdy, whatever. Oh, Dune. <laughs> oh, the 80s movie was so weird. <laughs> like, that would be the people's default. Since that movie has hit, I've gone on thrift books. I've gone to a used book library in the Dakotas. Uh, I could not find used copies of Dune. No. None existed. At all. I had to go buy new books from Amazon because there were none available. Mm -hmm. That doesn't usually happen. When I went to the used bookstore in Wyoming, when we were up there in, at, in Cheyenne over this Christmas, I couldn't find used copies of Dune for nothing. The power of that movie, which I need to see, and many of us have, is, is that it revitalized an interest in Dune. Yeah. It awoke a great amount of people being like, it's a 19-book series? Gimme. The Sleeper Awakens. The Sleeper Awakens. But the thing is, the, the first book of Dune, just Dune itself, yeah. is a great just standalone story. You don't yeah. really need to go past this. You can. Yeah. Which is, there's deep, deep waters, folks. Yeah. Um, but the first book itself is just a fantastic, great sci-fi um, story. And it's like, we were lucky to even get it because he couldn't get it published for, for ages. Yeah. And it took a company that printed like car manuals. <laughs> really? Yes. Which, to, which company? It's like uh, Chipton Books or Chil something. Oh, Chilton? Chilton? Yeah. Chilton, yeah. It's Chilton. No. Yes. Come on. And they were the ones that got it published because one of the guys there read it and was just kind of like, we need to take a chance on this. Yeah. Chilton's books? Yeah. Yes. You were... <laughs> I'm not. I'm not kidding. Like, okay. Oh we, my god. Here we go. Are you ready for this? So, Dune was first published by Analog Magazine as two serialized stories, Dune yep. World of Edda, and was finally contracted by Sterling Lanier, editor at Chilton Books, a well-established no publisher yes. for its business-to-business -business magazines and automotive, oh, man. automotive mechanics manuals. Yeah. So See, I'm not making it up. Chilton's. But, Chilton's is a staple in my house when I was growing up. Yeah, yes, we I had always had somebody who was working on something with their hands. Yeah, so, so mechanics, yeah, absolutely. But they started selling it at the time the book was like so big and chunky, like it flopped because no one was really paying attention to it so, except yeah. for sci-fi other authors, and they yeah. read it and they were the ones like, "This is amazing! What are you doing?" But at the time, I think the book was selling for like four dollars and change, yeah. which if you convert it nowadays dollars, a copy a of lot this of book was like fifty bucks. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot. So of money. like it would never sell. But all of a sudden, it just caught fire in the sci-fi wow. community, and it exploded in popularity. And right. then we got the Dune, and we got. They even fired that Stephen Lanier guy because it did so bad at the start. Really? Ouch. Yes. So here's an interesting comparison. I'm looking at AbeBooks.com, which That's nuts. you can get like really rare books on there apparently. So for the Doom custom clamshell case from the first edition, no book. In this clamshell case. It's just a case for the book. Just a case for the book from the original seller from Chilton. $275. Oh, oh it gets better. Christ. It's get better. Here we go. So Dune, seller, Chilton Books, whatever. The first first yeah. edition. First mm -hmm. edition mm -hmm. jacket only. This is the jacket. No book. That's the dust cover, guys. Yeah. $3,451. Yeah, you know what? Collectibles. Yeah. Collect yeah. That's, nuts. That's a collectible. first edition jacket. Uh, the yeah, these are first edition jackets. There's no books. Okay, so here's the <laughs> first edition, third printing of the author's masterpiece, original boards, boldly signed by Frank Herbert on the title page. Da -da -da, Nine thousand eight 
hundred dollars. Nice. See, but that's signed by Frank. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The, and oh, here here's even better. So hardcover, conditioned fair, first edition, a good only first edition water damage signed on the title page. And water damage. Twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, books are but so those first who are edition, not familiar. Yeah, books are worth some money. Yeah. But yeah. His good books are worth money. Old books are worth money. Yeah, you know, depending on the nuts. circles you travel in. That's but nuts. it is universally acclaimed by yeah. like the contemporary writers of his time. When they read this book, they were blown away. And they all agreed that it was fantastic. As soon as they start, like, created the Hugo and Nebula Awards, it immediately won them both. Right. Wow. Yeah, I did not know about the Chilton Connection. That's, that's, a ri- that's super cool, though. Yeah. Because when you think about today, like today's publishing world is so much more different than it was 50 plus years ago. Like back in the day, you really had to hustle to get a book published. Like you had to know mm-hmm. somebody or someone had to take a chance on you. And so the fact that he, <laughs> the fact that he ended up with Chilton of all the places to get published with, um, that's kind of hilarious. Well, yeah, because like, they, they, he, like it, was his, it was an article by his son that I wrote where it's like the, the son said like he struggled so hard to get it out there because a lot of publishers would just read and be like, I don't understand it. I'm getting lost. This is too, like, I, no. I, I'm, there's too many complicated words in here. And they wanted him to change the whole book up, and he just refused. Huh. Or so to little, simplify it and make it shorter. And so it was like, deep. No. Yep. So it's deep. Okay. Yeah, so no, for, for, those, for those who are, who are listening to this, wondering also, if you have a car and you drive and you're mechanically inclined, or maybe not. Just go to an auto parts store and get either a Haynes or a Chilton's manual for your vehicle. Uh, you'll not be disappointed if you own that vehicle for any length of time. Chances are you're going to be able to turn a wrench on something on that car. You're on your own. Huh. Mm-hmm. So interesting thing about Lanier. So he actually personally tracked down Frank Herbert with co- to convey Chilton's offer. Is yeah. that right? Like oh, pers- wow. he was responsible for tracking down the That's author. Super cool. And saving and he, he had read he had read he had read Dune World or Dune World in Analog magazine. He tracked him down and said, "Hey, we want to publish this." Yeah. More than 20 other publishing companies had refused. And so despite his brilliant despite Lanier's brilliant insight, he was dismissed from Chilton a year later because oh. of high publication costs yep. and poor initial book sales. Um, he worked so I wasn't all, making it up, guys. Yeah. <laughs> what a bummer. He worked as an editor for a couple other companies. Um, the most he actually Lanier had some all his own writings. Um, crypto adventure brigadier Donald Fellows told in the club story of the uh, other stuff and post-apocalyptic novels heroes hero's journey and the unforsaken hero which i am fascinated um his short story a father's tale in 1974 was a world fantasy award nominee his major works include hero's journey the unforsaken hero and brigadier fellows series are now available in electronic versions for kindle so that's kind of cool he also was a sculpture Oh yeah, our man from from Chilton Magazine or Chil- Chilton uh, Annuals. Uh, they are exhibited in many ma- museums, including the Smithsonian Institution of all places. Well, that's no joke. He specialized in miniatures, which James, I know oh. that's an interest of yours. Oh yeah, I love miniatures. Among which a series featuring featuring, and here's the best part about this connection: we're a series featuring characters from J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the, the Rings. Oh, is that right? <laughs> One set Very nice. was given to Tolkien himself. With whom Lanier corresponded. Nice. That's and cool. of course, the best part of the story, Tolkien reportedly admired the miniatures, but did not want them to be marketed commercially. So a why I wish Lanier respected. So if those had been pub had been sold, oh, could you imagine that market right now? That'd be crazy. It'd be a oh. different it'd be a whole different world, wouldn't it? Oh my gosh, you would be like hunting those down, trying to find them. Well, I'm, someone would be. Someone <laughs> Well, yeah. I just I love But I, I love, mean if you do want uh Lord of the Rings miniatures is actually a good line out of Games Workshop. Okay. The guys that do Warhammer, yeah. they have the rights to do the miniatures for Lord of the Rings stuff. Okay. So they have some really cool little ones if you want to I'll put that on my out. put that on my list Games, of hobbies that I want to explore is miniatures eventually. Games Workshop is based where? Based where? It's based out of is well, it? Uh, London, England. Oh, no, it's not. It's a... Uh, Glastonbury, I think. Oh, my brain okay. is failing me. Sorry. But yeah, it's based you don't out have of to England. know. Yeah. As long, <laughs> I was like, it's not because there's a lot of there's a lot of Lord of the Rings stuff that's done like the all of the wasn't all the special effects done out of Weta Workshop? Yeah. For the movies, yeah, that was way down all in right, New okay. Zealand. Yeah. So yeah. It is. Yeah. Yes. Where it was filmed, obviously. Right. Yeah. Well, and to to f- further down that rabbit trail for just a moment before we go back to Dune, um, Amazon, their new series, the prequel, 
is coming soon. The ad, the the trailer hit this last week, week and a half, um, and it's going to be very interesting to see how they do it because they're telling the story of the rings of power. Yeah. Of the previous that are hinted at. So this is sorry. This is the beginning. This is the beginning before before. Right, Hobbit. before the Hobbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Hobbit. yeah. I guess yeah. you could say yeah. because this, you this don't, will be long you don't before know the Hobbit. You know, you only read. So, and this is again, I, I'm a bad human, so I don't read very well. <laughs> bad human, right? So we're not going to stick your read, hand in a box and torture you. When I was pain. when I was supposed to read Tolkien in ninth grade, yeah, I couldn't hang because it just went on and on about the introduction in The Hobbit yeah. for like mm-hmm. three three and a half chapters. Well, and The Hobbit is notoriously hard to get a handle on. Uh, you know what I did? What? I watched the ori- the original <laughs> cartoon. <laughs> the Rankin Bass ones? Yes. yes. <laughs> they just yes, fist bumped. They're amazing. Oh, no. you know, they there's are a fist excellent. bump between me and Dallas. They're, that, they're excellent oh. because they follow the book exactly. Yeah. And they tell the story very well. And they're actually very, very well animated. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're, they are excellent. If you've not seen them before, please watch them. Please okay. watch them all because okay. I believe they did the whole series. N- no, they only did two. Oh, they only did the two halves of The Hobbit? They did Hobbit, and so it's one whole thing. So you can watch the whole Hobbit in Rank and Bass Glory, which is great. Uh-huh. And then they did, like, they couldn't get the funding to do much of anything else, so they did The Return of the King. Uh, okay, so they did the okay. very last mo- the book. The last book in the series. Uh, okay. and Which is another good watch, but it's kind of sad because you miss everything in between. Okay. But there was another company that did, like, an, another version of, like, The Fellowship. And it's the most awkward, weird animation possible. I forget who's the shop that did that. It is a terrible watch. I, I wouldn't even that. I don't recommend it because it looks so don't, awkward. Don't don't even don't even like hate watch it. Yeah, don't even hate watch it. I just <laughs> skip it. Okay. But the Rankin Bass stuff because I used to have them on my. Oh yeah. My parent, my my dad bought them for me. Thank you, Dad. Um, awesome. A long time. I used I ran the Hobbit. I wore it down so it broke. Oh my gosh, really? Because I used to watch it so much because I love so it. So we're, we're talking it's about a the, good we're show. talking about the it's 1970, good. Good. 1978 version, which mm-hmm. was by directed by Ralph Bakshi. Bakashi from nineteen seventy eight. And uh, the animation the animation is great, even though it's old, but it's all hand of course in that day you had to do it all hand drawn, right? So it's the it's it's anime and it's glory. It's good stuff. Yeah. I enjoyed it. And like Rank and Bass did a bunch of like the uh, Thundercats, the original Thundercats and oh, stuff like that. Okay. Oh man, Mike and Bass yes. had some hits. Okay. That's just a solid kinda, I wanted one. them to keep going and do more of those animations. That's so great. Like, because he makes like the bad guys look so evil and like twisted and weird. They, it's kind of like yes. And they yeah, there was there was some good when they do the um, when they meet the ogres. Is it the ogres? Oh, uh, but the trolls. The, in the that trolls. First cave? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. When they meet the trolls. Is, is super awesome. The trolls are done very well. Mm-hmm. I have not seen this. I've I've heard of it. I've heard of it. I might have to explain. You have to, to turn. You're gonna have to turn this to to me so that I can get a little bit of a glimpse so that I know that we're talking about the well, same I thing. See, I let's see. Let, let's like, copy. This is our Dune damned. podcast that turned into <laughs> Lord of the Rings. It is so Dune. This, this but is what this is what I know. What I what they're saying is Lord. Okay, of the yeah. Rings. So you, is this the one you're talking about? Let's see. Um. That first, yeah, that's the terrible one. Oh, that's the terrible one. So that's yeah, the 1978 one. Yeah, that's the 1978 one is the terrible. Okay, so what's the good one then? The good one is look down a couple more pictures. Turn your screen back towards me. Ah, uh, uh, shoot. I just clicked the wrong thing. So is it Okay, this The one? Hobbit, that first one, good. And then that last one is the other one. Is the other one. Okay, interesting. So if you're wondering, you just go Google and search for Lord of the Rings. Um, the, one with the, the one that is the one that we're familiar with, that everyone else is familiar with, is from 1978. Um, the other two, The Hobbit, which features a troll-looking like Hobbit character, mm-hmm. and then Return of the King looks a little. I don't know how I feel about it. It looks different. It does look different. I mean, you know, whatever. Because I'll admit, as like as a kid when I watched them, because I was a little kid and had read. I didn't know the books existed. Yeah. I just knew these stories and just. I was always kind of like, where's the middle sections? Yeah. Because I see The Hobbit, and then you go to all the way to the very end, where all of a sudden it's like Merry Pippin and all the other ones, and like the Return of the King. I'm kind of like, well, what? Yeah. They I'm didn't going. introduce them. Yeah, I'm kind of like, uh, I'm kind of What happened? Lost. But yeah, those are the two I had at least. I don't know if they actually did another, Ring and Bass did another one of them, but yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, there you go. There's your Lord of the Rings backstory in deep, sli- slightly deep dive into the information about it. <laughs> I, I am optimistic about the Lord of the Rings series, but I am, I am cautiously optimistic. I'm a bit worried because it is a, doing prequels is always a dangerous thing. Doing prequels is always a bit of a 
bit of a nerve thing because mm -hmm. that's why me, me, myself, and James have steadfastly avoided Star Trek Discovery because it's a prequel to the Star Trek world. And that was the original problem that I had with Star Trek Enterprise is because it was like, why didn't we go forward? Why are we going back to tell a story that we know enough about that we don't need to see it told? Even though Enterprise was pretty good, it just wasn't, it just kind of, and the theme song, I have feelings about the Star Trek Enterprise theme song. <laughs> haven't started it yet it's it's what well, <laughs> i need to because this podcast eventually will tackle it so anyway those are that's like that's the whole thing about the fellow the lord of the rings the new series but amazon's putting serious money in it like, yeah they're talking billions and they dollars. gave them tons of time yeah so it's kind of like that's why i have faith is like usually when you leave a creator alone yeah and give them time to like cook things oh yeah and then have them like start to actually work on it and yeah. go, instead of just pushing them just being like here's money keep it going keep yeah. keep that pot simmering yeah. You know, that's when you're going to get something good. Yeah. Which in some ways is what the new Dune movie people have said is, is that they let them have the freedom to tell the story and to do it in a stylistic fashion that wasn't like lens flares and everything else. Which yeah. When did, we, when did we even hear about the rumblings that Dune, the movie, was going to come out and it was going to be directed by Dennis Villeneuve? Like, I, I, it, was, it was like a year and a half prior to it coming out i believe or right. even production starting i can't remember yeah and it was kind of like people were like why, why like people slow actually, rumble yeah people like question it they're like why do we Are need a sure? dune we've already why got a dune yeah yeah dune movie um, but nowadays announced. it's like okay one of the reasons that i that i am ex i will be excited to see this because yeah. one of my favorite movies blade runner the original the director's cut is mm -hmm. a brilliant movie blade yeah. runner's great blade runner is an excellent movie yep yeah good special effects even oh, yeah. for the time absolutely mm -hmm. and then i i read the story by yeah. philip k dick <laughs> do androids dream of electric sheep do, yes do who is actually buried here in fort morgan sheep, yeah. who is actually buried in fort morgan next to his sister, which i found out his child his <laughs> infant to james sister, his infant sister who did not survive childbirth yep. or childhood but i i read the story and then i wanted i wanted blade runner I wanted Blade Runner to be what mm. Blade Runner 2049 is uh, as far as special yeah. effects. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. When you start reading about how yeah. the how that that environment is yeah. and, and the vehicles and the way mm -hmm. the way, you know, he operates, that story is super slow. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is you have to slog through it. But mm -hmm. if you slog through it, there are some very very poignant moments mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. And I want that. I wanted that world. Yeah. In Blade Runner. Right. But I got that world in Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Right. Yeah. But you didn't. Would you say you so, didn't get a great story in twenty forty nine? I liked twenty. I actually liked the story. Okay. But you I, were you were the tech like the the special effects were what you had wanted. Special effects yeah. are that world that you see in Blade Runner twenty forty nine is what yeah. I want for Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Right. Gotcha. And Blade Runner on its own, without if I think if we had not oh. gotten twenty forty nine, Blade Runner would have stood on its own for it. Ever. Still does. Oh yeah, yeah. and still it does. still does. Yeah, it's so brilliant. Yeah, and you you look at the actors in that movie. You look at Harrison Ford. You look at those guys who played those characters to such perfection, and the and the how the director like fa facilitated all that. Yeah, it is. It's it's kind of there's there's very few movies that people consider perfect films in the like film world um i think blade runners in the running for that uh, back to the future the original first back to the future is definitely yeah, that's def like the best movie ever. yeah and oh, they actually it's use up, they, yeah, it's they, up there. <laughs> they use back to the future in film school as an example of the perfect movie this is the way you do it this is how you do it this is how you structure this is how you do that um it's been a while since i've seen blade runner but i can just remember being in awe of how they created the world mm -hmm. and how they made you feel and the music the music to just is well, that synth and stuff oh and my God. it's so dark all the tones and yeah. stuff yeah, yeah, and it, but yeah. it's not done in a way that's like oh it's corny or whatever like it legitimately you suspend your disbelief you believe yeah. in what's happening in front of you you mm -hmm. experience it as if you're living in that world and you're just riding along with these guys and going oh my goodness this is intensity but don't go into there like don't go pick up the book thinking you're going to get that movie. Yeah. Cuz that oh, book yeah, no. is no, like no 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 no. The book <laughs> so the story, different than the story is so the slow. Movie. Like yeah. it, it is a warning to people that want to go read <laughs> to Andrew's Dream and Electric Sheep because they see the movie and say oh this great sci-fi detective movie is like no don't. that book is like way different. It's super slow. And talks about a whole bunch of different other stuff. Yeah. And the la the very the only here's the and here's the bummer of it but also the kind of the where one of the most poignant parts happens mm -hmm. is in the story, B 
because the story, I wouldn't call it a book. I would call it a story because it's about 200 pages. Yeah. In the story, you get the last maybe about 30 pages mm-hmm. where they finally start to engage yeah. in the actual tenement. Right. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And the, it, it's it's so slow. Yeah. But if you can bear with it, you can see the world and understand the world that is built. So that's cool. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about some uh, certain authors is when you read them, you're just like, this is this is intense. Like, for example, The Hobbit. Like I was talking, The Hobbit is a slog. I have never finished The Hobbit. I have started it more times than I can count. It is a slog. But here's the best part about that is if you can if you can if if you if you have to if you toss away the hobbit if you can't make it through the hobbit that's not there's no big deal but it lets you get to lord of the rings two towers and return of the king and that's where tolkien hits his stride i don't know to me i've always found the hobbit to be the easier read because he intended that to be for children <laughs> he intended that to be for children i, don't I read know. that in ninth grade are you kidding me no well, i'm not in tolkien he, he in wrote Tol- it for his children. you can google this yeah no i know you're I'm not i'm not i don't dis i don't <laughs> the harder books are the lord of the rings books i'm not not believing you james <laughs> i'm just not not believing the fact that's written for children it's written for children i think it was written for i mean you can even bang Tol- my head on this desk <laughs> <laughs> please don't i don't have the insurance <laughs> so <laughs> tolkien he was writing for kids, I think, I want to say England, English, English, English kids. English kids, yes. He and was writing not, for his kids. Not to say that English kids are smarter than us or we're smarter than English kids or whatever, but... Li- <laughs> okay, we'll go with... We'll go with... We'll go with them. <laughs> so the idea there is that, like, literature in England and l- the writing in England and the way that he wrote and, the, and, the, and people consumed is there was a higher complexity to stories that students and kids were were engaged in um i think in our time in our world yeah lord of the rings is intense it's a that's it, an intense book it's a it's you 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 it challenges you and it yeah. pushes you yeah. but i think i feel this is an i feel statement because i don't know anything for certain but i feel like in that day and age in tolkien's time it was more expected that okay if you're a middle school kid I, you're reading lord of the rings like you have to be able to consume this mm-hmm. you have to be able to All do right. this and so for you to say I'll well, go with that yeah <laughs> I can go along with that. Well, well, I, can, I really can. Well, well, I can get that. We're not getting any objections from the from the th- su- Supreme Court of Nerddom here, so we're good. So I think that's that's what we 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 think is we're like when James says, "Yeah, it was written for kids," and it was. Yes. But when we think about what what we are exposed to when we read, it's a very different world than what they. Now, I I firmly believe that yes, we can get our we can get kids to read more complex texts. We can we can we get, should we can get to that point. But this is not the education. I mean, this isn't like, yeah, that was like this is a deeper we, conversation. We kind of hit it on this earlier yeah. before the podcast. Me and yeah. you talking about books and the stuff yeah. we feed kids nowadays yeah. for their brains. Yeah. It's kind of like, like how did we go from like the Hobbit is easily readable by like a ten to twelve year old and that's yeah. fine. Yeah. To if you give them the Hobbit nowadays, they'd be like, no. Right. Well, I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's. If I mean, it also depending them, on kid, but it's also like if you gave them can. that book, that right. book when they're ten. Yeah. Are they going to actually absorb it? Like, can they get it? Are we teaching to I, a level that they I can actually they can. absorb that? I think they can. It's just are, you need no, no, no. What I'm talk. saying is, are we teaching to the level that they'll be able to get it? Oh. And if we're not teaching to that level, then right. no, don't hand them that book. So mm. there's a, I have a friend, uh, a teacher on Twitter. I don't know. I'm not right. a teacher, yeah. but so I know I, what I learned yeah. when I was in third I, grade. I can speak yeah. to that a little bit. So I have a friend on Twitter. Her name is Jasmine. Um, I'll have to now tweet at her when I, when I, when we publish this episode, right? Because I'm a, I'm a name dropper. Um, I'll give you her username in just a second as soon as I can pull up my Twitter account. But she talks a lot about, and there's a lot of folks, and I am not here to start an argument um, with with this whole situation. Um, so her Twitter account is Miss Jasmine MN. Um, she is currently in, in in good old jolly old England as a teacher. Oh, nice. um, she is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant lady, a brilliant woman. Like she is, she's got a master's, like this this woman is incredible. Like I worship at Jasmine's feet at how good she is and how much she knows. Like there, if, if there was someone that I would love to have in my building as a language arts teacher that I could just like hang out with and just watch teach like a master, Jasmine is that person. And I, I've told her that and I'm not ashamed to say it now, but Jasmine has brought forth a theory as men, as some other teachers on Twitter have about the young adult fiction kind of genre. Mm-hmm. 
and how explosive growth has occurred in the last 10 years and even the last five years, how it it's no longer like the Harry Potter and, you know, the Aragon and like Rick Riordan. It's not that anymore. Mm -mm. It is so much more and has become almost it's like beyond the genre of fiction. Young adult fiction has become its own beast. Oh, yeah. And what Jasmine and others have suggested and in some ways have provided evidence in pieces for is the occupation and interest in young adult fiction has actually contributed to a lessening of cons of consuming of adult level literature. So you have adults mm. who will, are now read, who are no longer making the leap to, you know, the, the the Pattersons. They're not making the leap to the Crichtons. They're not leaping to the Dean Koontz. They're not leaping into the deep, in complex, deep reading experiences of adult literature. They're skewing into young adult literature and staying there because it's comfortable, it's easy, any 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 amount of, of kind of label that you could put on there. Yeah. And so the concern, which I have not yet decided where I sit or stand on this, to be clear, I, I but I see their point because if all you feed your readers is young adult fiction, and I'm not saying that young adult fiction fiction isn't fiction or it's not reading. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Right. But it is written with a particular level quote unquote, if you want to go with that, which of course will probably upset some people on Twitter and I'm okay with that. I'm just, I'm trying to relate this. Mm -hmm. if, if all you consume is a certain level to a certain extent. So if all you, if, if the words and complexity of the sentences and the complexity of the ideas are written to a seventh or eighth grade level or whatever, if that's all an adult reader consumes without branching into the adult and fiction world, yeah. the concern is not only are we losing the strength and complexity within our adult readers, but now those adult readers who have kids and will have children, yes. they're not going to feed their kids the next level in book. Yeah. They're going to keep giving them the Harry Potters. They're going to keep giving them the young, young adults. They're going to keep giving them you know, the Rick Reed, Like the They're not going to hand them Tolkien. Right. They're not yeah. going to give them Tolkien. They're not going to give them these, and not even just Tolkien, but any of your, like if you walk into Barnes & Noble and you look at the adult fiction section and you like grab a Preston Child book or you grab whatever, like I can go over there like, not going to be reading Neil Stevenson, right? You yeah, know, like definitely it, not. So they, which that's, is super unfortunate. That's the concern that Jasmine and others in the, in the teacher community on Twitter have expressed at various points in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and I, I I'm not going to take a sit a sit a seat or a stand on this, but I am going to say I don't think they're wrong. I think there is legitimate concern because we talk about how the writing today of movies and 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 television and even some books in the ones that we've kind of looked at. Television and movies are written to children. Yes. Oh yeah. And well, it's not written. A, this is a lot of off podcast no, wait, conversations. Wait, this is way out. Have. Also, yes. this is also way out. Yeah. Right. Keep, yeah. keep in mind, we're on, we are we really are talking about Dune, but from yeah. this perspective, right? You have to think about if you're mass marketing to something. Yeah. You want to make sure you capture the greatest audience. Mm -hmm. Yep. And to capture the greatest audience, you have to think about the and this speaks no ill mm -hmm. about the individuals that are watching oh yeah but you have to capture from six let's look at the demographic you have to go right. from 65 years old yep. and or older yep to 18 year olds or even and younger or younger yeah because yeah. you're trying to capture the next generation right and you have to write for that so they write at yeah if you want to capture the largest audience yeah write to the lowest common denominator right. which is the youngest so that everybody can understand right so some of those people who are out there are going, hey, I'm watching this thing and you make me feel stupid. Yeah. That's probably why. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So I was watching, so I love the Witcher TV series. I yep. watched the first series. I loved it. Not a fan never, of it. Never watched okay. it. I would. In, Although when, Henry Cavill. Hey, yes. that's one sexy Hen human. Yeah. <laughs> Henry Cavill is, he is a nerd like all of us. Oh, yeah. He builds his computers. He is, he loves the Witcher. He, he loves Warhammer 40K. There, so there's a couple of videos on YouTube where he like goes through and says, okay, this is the level of care that we had with our fight scenes. Here's what we did to make sure that our sword movements and the way that we held the swords and the way that we designed the swords made sense and also match the game and match the and match yeah, well not just the game, game but also the but like also, yeah, but making sure that everything cool. connected and it was like so his intensity with making sure that it's legit and genuine that's important um but with the witcher people were upset with the witcher season one 
because apparently, and I, I agree that it did a little bit, but I, I again, used my brain and I figured out where we were at. The, the first series of Witcher switches around timelines. Yes. So it plays very fast. It can, it can mix, mix you up. But what it was hoping to do and what movies used to do and books and media used to do, again, this is very broad brush, so just hold on. They would trust you as a reader or a viewer to figure it out. Yes. You are smart enough to figure out what we're doing and you'll make the connection eventually. Yeah, and we don't have to hold your hand. Yes. Or, or you won't. And then you'd be lost. Right. Or you have to mm-hmm. rewatch it, yeah. which I've had to rewatch many movies and go, oh. Oh, yeah. Well, so we, like, we were, we were, this, for my GED class that I teach on the weekdays, we were reading Kate Chopin's The Story of an Hour, the ending of that, of that story. Okay. And it's The Story of an Hour, and the wife hears or is given news that her husband is dead, at, killed in an accident on the streets of Victorian England or whatever time period, whatever. And so, the story says, well, he loved her. The, the husband loved her, no questions asked. But the story then says, well, the wife, when she heard the news, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm free. Dobby's a free elf. Yeah. And, oh, damn. And, but what ha- so here gets the best what part. What a bummer. So, but here, here, yeah, here comes the best part. So it, it, she, it, it spends a couple of paragraphs talking about how she felt about his love and what it felt like to her oh. and the overbearing nature of it and all this yep. and how the, his the absence of him and his loss suddenly gave her freedom. And she felt like she now had that freedom. Well, the story ends, spoiler alert, the story was written many years ago, uh, with the door opening, and guess who walks through the door? Husband. The husband. And Not dead after all. Correct. And so like everyone's like, oh my gosh, you're still alive. And the wife dies. And the doctor... Broken heart. Yep. Yep. Not, well, yeah, and yeah. heart disease. And the doctor... Legit who, broken heart. Yeah, the doctor theorized, is, or, or theory, which was wrong, because as a reader, you're figuring that out. The doctor goes, oh, well, she died of a broken heart, heart disease. You know, she, the surprise of him returning broke her. Like, it, it overwhelmed her. Blah, blah. But the right. truth of the matter was her heart was broken and the heart disease because she realized she was no longer free. Yeah. Oh, she had, like, 15 seconds of freedom or 15 yeah. minutes of freedom. And then he shows back up. And all of that is gone. Yeah, it's like all the emotional oh, weight terrible. and chains that were like holding her yeah, down were released. Were gone. It's like yes. And then he shows up, and then and bam, back on the chains, and she's dead. So what happened is, is that we spent about fifteen minutes reading that story that last, like it was Friday night, um, and getting grasping the concept took us two or three reads because it wasn't written in a simple, explainable way. Yeah. It was written with complex, complex ideas and complex conversations. And so even when I had my students who were remote and even in person, they were like, wait, what does that mean? It's like, okay, well, let's go back. We got to go back to the first paragraph and read back through again. Yeah. Now do you see? Oh, now I see. Yeah, because they're saying this and that. Oh, those are keywords. Yeah, so then you got to do this and that. And then, you, then a third read through, and then we look at how the answers are phrased, and we go, so when he says this, they mean that and this. And then one of my students was like, oh, my gosh, I get it now. That is the power of complex literature, complex movies, complex television, because it requires you to be engaged. And it might require another viewing or reading or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, again, biased as a language arts teacher, that's the power of good stuff, is it makes you stop and go, wait a second. It is the best part about like being a literature, te- literature teacher. Right. It is and so, so good with, with to pull Dune, the story apart. With Dune, to bring, we can continue running parallel with Dune, but with Dune... Like I did have to go back yeah. and a, con a couple of p- p- par- parts in this book, go back and go, okay, wait, what just happened? Okay, oh, well, oh. Frank okay. Herbert himself said when he finished this book, yeah. just this one, yeah. he wrote it with leaving a whole bunch of stuff kind of unresolved and yeah. unexplained because yeah. he wanted you to go back and try to pull through those layers yeah. and try yeah. to draw your own yeah. definitions of what this was. He did it on purpose. Yeah. Did it, did it, any good book that I've ever read, yeah, that isn't a fluff book, yeah, it is has been one that I've had to go back to, mm-hmm. maybe a paragraph, maybe a chapter, mm-hmm. yeah. or something like that, yeah, to to reread and make sure I understand exactly what, yeah, exactly what's coming through, yeah. Um, for those who are not party to see the excitement in both Aaron and James, yeah. Uh, <laughs> They, they're the passion I see in people who teach and want to impart that mm-hmm. same passion of the thing that they love yeah. on their students is very apparent in both of these individuals. 
So, and I appreciate that very much well, and I, here, here's the thing. I love passionate teachers. Well, and I, it's not even just like, even before I was a teacher, like, so I've only been, this is my fourth year teaching, right? I've, yeah. I've been in the program. I went to school four years. So very in, in the eight, last eight years, whew, that's a long time between going into college <laughs> for the degree and then working here. Um, it's been about seven or eight years total. But even before that, like my, I, I loved to read and reread, like, there are books on my shelf that I, or that I've, I've, I've refilled my shelves because I've lost them that I absolutely adore. That's, those are, so here's, so you're not seeing this on the podcast and I'll explain this. I think I've explained it before, but I'll explain it again. So when I taught six, when I taught sixth grade for two years at the middle school, I, over those two years, I built myself a library of over 700 books. I had to bring in extra bookshelves. Now, when I left the middle school to come here to the alternative high school, which was a, a position that was, was open to me and I interviewed for, um, I had to basically half my collection because, Ouch. well, cause the, a lot of the books were middle school kit were middle yeah. school and they would have been better served staying yeah, at yeah. the middle school and being a part of that library. And so I took most of my like high school materials and high school books and transferred them. So my current library is probably maybe around, I don't know, 200, 300. I haven't done a full count at some point I will. But there are books on those shelves that I have read and I, I hold on to them because there is su- there's a memory with those. Yeah. There's a memory with what I've read. Um, the I book- hold my books like trophies, man. Well, every not, one of them. Yeah. Every one of them. Because, they sit. I well, cannot get rid of those. Well, and you want to go back That's and you read it. You want to go back and check it out. I completed that. Um, one of my favorite series um, that, I, that I've been collecting is and this is going to be a flashback to a movie with Russell Crowe is the Master and Commander book series. So it start Master and Commander the you know Far Side of the World is actually based on a book series by and it the series itself I think is 20 to 30 book series. Oh my goodness. And it follows the captain and his doctor friend which is Paul Bettany in the movie and Russell Crowe in the um in there. So the Master and Commander book series is by, is the Auburn and Maturin series. So Captain Aubrey and Dr. Maturin. It is by Patrick O'Brien. Patrick O'Brien um, died, I think, in 2000, 2000. He was 85 years old. He was born in 1914. But he wrote um, 20 books. And they were authentic about sailing in the Napoleonic era. It is incredible. I've read the first book in that series, The Master, the Far Side of the World, or whatever the first book is. Yeah. And I just, when I, when I was done with it, I was like, oh my God. This is amazing. And so I have been on the hunt for the last couple of years to get the full collection so that I can get start with book one and read through that series. Because I'm not a nautical guy. I'm not a boat person. But with how the author writes it, it feels like I'm right there. Mm-hmm. And he, and the information that's given, I'm able to connect and go, oh, yeah, I know what that is. Okay, cool. Or if I don't know what it is, I'll figure it out as I go. Or it'll get explained. Yeah, it'll get explained. Explain, like somehow or, yeah. I will feel, and I can picture it in my head. And so that's the power of, of authors like that is, is that they give you this rich world or they give you this dynamic experience and they trust you to make the connections. Yep. So, like yeah. Frank Herbert has done, other authors have done where they're not going to spoon feed you. They're not going to be like, okay, here's your answer. Pat on the head now. Go on to the next chapter. It's like, no, I, I want you to make me think. I want you to make me go, okay, what's really going on here? Mm-hmm. And so my experience with books has all like Dean Koontz. Dean Dean Koontz scares the heck out of me a lot. Like uh velocity, uh intensity, a lot of his books are magnificently written, like Stephen King level of good. Because but they 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 almost they put you in their seat of the experience. And so I would end chapters of Dean Koontz's book with like my heart just racing. Oh wow. And I'm just like okay, I need to take a break from this book because oh, I'm going to have a heart attack if I keep reading. Like, it's that good. And so I go back to Dean Koontz and he recently, he did a couple of years back, he did a, a Frankenstein book series mm-hmm. where he brought back the mon- the Frankenstein's monster mm. into the modern era and kept the original origin story intact and brought the monster into Louisiana and New Orleans. Oh, and, wow. And, and, and just incredible characterization. And I, like the characters that he brings, the characters he introduces that are, are everyman characters, just you, 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 you love them and you just like, I was, I was sold like within the first couple pages. I'm like, all right, Dean, let's, let's go, let's go, let's do this. And you want, and it, it, 
it pulls you forward, but you're also like, I want to see what happens. And that's the other side of the book that is powerful is if you're like, okay, what are they going to do now? Okay, I want to know. I got to go. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. And that's the power of Dune. And that's the power of a good book is, is that you're like, I need to know what happens next because I'm invested. I'm yep. bought in. And the power of Dune is, yeah, it's 800 some odd pages long, but it is brilliant and mm -hmm. it pulls you and it pushes you and you kind of start to sketch out in your head the different political dynamics and it's the same with any book that, that is good that's well written so you end up binge reading i do yeah. so this is this is a for those who are netflix yeah this is like it's okay the, it's the we've early started <laughs> we've we've got like half halfway through the first season of sons of anarchy and then yeah you're like oh i'm not going to bed tonight yep and I have to force myself because there's like there's like I will I will I'll get I will in trouble with that. Yeah, <laughs> I won't go near Netflix or any other streaming services during the weekdays because yeah. I know if I start, I I'm not going to want to stop. So like on Friday nights into Saturdays or Sundays, like that's when my binging or my viewing time comes into play. Yeah, um, and even like reading, like I want to be able to make sure that I have enough time set aside, and that's part of my my New Year's path is making sure I find time to read. My hope is as on Saturdays I can actually do some of that now. Um, because I need I need to have my reading in my life because without reading uh, I I need I need that I need that feed into my life so books we're talking we're, we're 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 kind of in and out of Dune which is fine what is a book that and we've talked about this a little bit I think in the past but what's a book or a book series or an author that you read or have read and you just went that is one strong writer you you were both looking at me. Uh, um, there, I can give you two. Hmm. Uh, Brandon Sanderson, yep. and the other one is Joe Abercrombie. Yep. Okay. Both of them have written books that are just yeah, like their world building yeah, and the structures in which they put in place yeah. and how they handle their characters within those rules of the world and the structure of those worlds. Yeah, it's fantastic. Especially Sanderson is probably my number one favorite author right now because of his world building. Yeah. And he is complex because you can read one whole trilogy that has a good stop finish kind of thing or it finishes the story. Go read the other book series, whatever. And as you put them together, I'm going to give you guys a hint. They're all connected. Oh, yeah. And every single book. There's one series that is kind of separate, but then all these other book series that he's writing right now, which I think he's juggling like four. They're all connected because they all take place in the same universe, the same galaxy. It's just the action that is taking place in the different trilogies is taking place. And even some of his single books, mm -hmm. because he has short stories like Elantris, whatever, or single story kind of one shot things, um, are taking place on planets in that galaxy that are all tied together in this huge like meta story that's actually mm -hmm. taking place in the background. And like the one book series that I love the most because it's got the characters I like the most in it, uh, Stormlight Archive book series, um, is kind of like that is the current actions taking place in that universe mm -hmm. all the other books are kind of like the past hmm. and so one of the series is actually kind of catching up it's like the Mistborn series whatever i forget the actual name but the Mistborn series um is going through you're following there's one trilogy that takes place way far in the past on that planet and then they move forward to another section of, of books that take place after that trilogy which is taking place in like the middle area of that planet where everything is kind of like steampunky so you actually move that world forward, move the timeline so forward. The, yeah, yeah. And now there's a third trilogy that's going to come out, which is these people moving into that modern stuff with the Stormlight Archive people. And it's going to be those people from that planet learning to move through space hmm. and things like that. Interesting. And there's like a bigger, deeper kind of background stuff. Like he is building this huge, fantastic story that all kind of touches with each other and has effects because you learn that one really bad moment in time impacted all these people and all these planets. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. And like the Stormlight Archive stuff is like has, like I said, is some of like the last, not the last book, because that's whatever, but Oathbreaker, mm -hmm. Oathbringer, which is the third book in the Stormlight Archive is fantastic. Like it has some of the best, like here's our one character. All right, we're going to give you his background story, what happened with him. And lead you because he's he's he existed in the first book and the second book of that mm -hmm. series, but you kind of like he's kind of in the background. He's not too major one, and they bring him into the forward in like that third book, and he has some most amazing moments in that third book, where it's kind of like I love this character, hmm. 
and like what he's kind of like representing right now. Like, so it's really, really cool. I recommend Brandon Sanderson's books to anybody because you can even start them off. They're not super heavy, but they all do connect. Is and there's little, sometimes like you'll have little side characters that maybe only pop up once or twice in the story and you find out it's the same guy moving between all the different stories. Mm-hmm. Oh, is it, Bra- did you say Brandon? Brandon Sanderson, Sanderson yes. Okay. Which I can, I can break down and give you guys like a timeline of which order you should read this stuff in. But you can find it online pretty easy if you just Google it. And they have the timeline of how these books released. You can read them like that. Or you can go read them and be like, here's the actual like timeline of the universe of when these stories are taking place. Yeah. And it's pretty interesting to see where he's going to go. Because he, he has it kind of storyboarded out, I guess, by his own admission for years to come. Hmm. That's cool. Well, there you go. For for someone for people who are not not voracious readers, and or have trouble reading because I have trouble reading, so I I, I sort of have to force myself to do it. Um, for for those of you who don't know, I'm dyslexic, so I have a problem where words and letters swim on the page, which is it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Um, there's one writer who has been able to make my world disappear and put me in the world in the book, like mm-hmm. for legit. And I have seen hours melt off the clock without being tired. Hmm. It's Terry Pratchett. Oh, there you oh go. yeah. Uh, for for those of you who want to get into a, like a D and D adventure, please read The Color of Magic, and that is the start of the series yeah. of Discworld. Yeah. And like that book is kind of clunky, but it only gets better from there. Oh my gosh. It I clunkiness aside, when you laugh out loud and you have yeah. people wonder why you're laughing oh, yeah. out loud and you're reading, you're like, "Oh, sorry, it's this book." Uh, yeah, the I was Disc reading World Guards Guards when huge. I had that moment. So, the in the Discworld series, the Discworld world is huge and then the the that universe is huge and then um Another one that is for for the ability to explain real hard science, and I'm not I'm not a hard scientist, but I love the I love the the explanation and the result of the math th- that can explain some really cool physics. Um, Neil Stephenson is in that in that realm and that's it's because of seven eves and also the ending of that book is just so awesome mm-hmm. so for me and i'm just i'm looking through my goodreads because i haven't used goodreads i haven't updated my goodreads situation in a very long time um but one of the authors that i've liked and i need to get better at reading is robert b parker and Robert B. Parker originally did the Detective Spencer series. And I need to read that because I haven't examined that, but I've been told it's amazing. Um, the other one is he wrote a series with Virgil Cole and Everett Hitch called Appaloosa. It's the starting book in that series. And so there's like a whole series of those books um, that um, I originally read the first one and enjoyed it and need to get back into it. Um, the other one is obviously Tom Clancy. I love me some Tom Clancy. I love the character of Jack Ryan. It is one of my favorites. I haven't read any. Oh, it's the way what, what Clancy does so well. I've heard it's good, though. It, 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 and, it mm-hmm. is, and it is dense. It is complex. Yeah. Clancy knew his business. And those acronyms will blow you out of the water. Yeah. yeah they, Clancy, for those who don't, don't recall, also Rainbow Six yep. is all Tom mm-hmm. Clancy. Yep. Yeah, he his influence and his continued influence both on the book world and the video game world because Tom Clancy's name gets pasted on a whole bunch of other stuff. It does. And he I if I'm and I'm trying to remember this I think I believe he passed. Yes, um, he passed away. Yeah, he he did he did pass. And so some accusations have been leveled at the video game companies for using his name on the game series even though he's he's no longer with us and so mm. there's some of that but his Jack Ryan series um is some of the most powerful like and you you know like it's not like you're like oh okay did this really happen like Clancy did enough research and knew enough and engaged enough with people who knew the politics who knew yeah. all of that and so one of my favorite books of all times is um, Tom Clancy's Executive Orders. And spoiler alert, it's when Jack Ryan becomes president of the United States. Mm-hmm. 
And the way that story is told and the way it ends is just so satisfying as a reader because it's the, the plot begins with like a, a biological attack on the United States and there's all these things that are bad, things that are happening and blah, 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 blah. And you get to the end of, and so the bad guy, of course, is Iran and we're, you know, the United States is the good guy. Um, and so there's the guy who's leading Iran and he is exposed as the bad guy in a national address by the president. And they, his answer is letting him know, we know what you did, we know who you are, and we know where you are. This is the answer of the United States government. And it cuts to a live image of a ICBM or whatever video of a missile heading towards a target. And um, the guy, the, the, the Iranian leader who is now knows that he's going to be, he's in trouble. He would have been in trouble anyway, but now he realizes, he looks, and he says, oh no, that's my, that's the town, that's the city I'm in. I got to go. And he makes the move to run. And the, 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 the end of this book, I believe, if I remember correctly, is the narrating of the and the missile, the video closed in, mm. saw a door, like a door, a, a door is opened and a light comes out of the door. A figure is seen looking up and then pew, the camera, like the, the, the video cuts and it's over. That's the justice you want to see served. Sometimes. And that's just like that moment yeah. in that book. It's just like, yeah, we've spent, Everyone wants we've, that. we've spent a, a dune sized book. Yeah, yeah. Executive orders is a big one. We've sent a, we spent a dune sized book getting to that moment of going, come on, this guy's got to get it. We yeah, got to right? win. We got to win. Come on. And the, it, just the way that Clancy weaves that story is just like, oh yes, this is what I wanted. That's what I wanted to have happen. Jack Ryan is awesome and I love him to death. And I don't agree with what Amazon did with him because that is not Jack Ryan. That is nowhere near what Jack Ryan is like. For me, that's months of in, that's months of investment. Yeah. Right? That's like three months of investment right there. <laughs> no, but, but, but I want to make sure that we... One thing to touch on, though. Yeah. Books, if you're reading, yeah, please continue to do so. Yes, it doesn't please. matter what you're reading. Yeah. Right? So fluffy books yeah. or dense books or... Yeah young adult books or whatever yeah. they are read, continue read. to read yeah it doesn't matter J- like like wine like like well actually not like wine <laughs> but <laughs> Let's get our like all straight. things right like all things yeah. that require some amount of moderation is, no no i was gonna say that are all uh, require some amount of subjectivity oh yeah, yeah right yeah. it is r- read what you like to read yeah but continue to do so right if you want to challenge yourself, challenge yourself. Right. But don't think that, don't let anybody gatekeep you. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Read anything that you want to read. Right. But stick with it. Yeah. I agree. And I will, and I will add on to that challenge as we approach the hour and 12 minute mark for this podcast. I know, podcast. right? I knew we went off the rails and we're going <laughs> further and further and further. I mean, we, we kind of got off the track of doom. Way digression. It's yeah. okay. It's fine. Everything's fine. But the, the, the parting statement I will say is I am like, Dallas is correct. I, I'm not here to gatekeep you. I'm not here to tell you what you should or should not read. But I am here to tell you that don't limit yourself to what you're currently reading. And this this is just not just reading, but this is anything on your when you're searching on the internet, you're watching YouTube, whatever. Don't stop trying to learn something new. Mm-hmm. Don't stop trying to try something new, to try a new book, to look for a new series, to challenge yourself with something bigger, with something different, with something more complex or more challenge, whatever however you want to phrase that. Because our brains are built to learn. And in this day and age, in 2022, with the TikTok and the Facebooks and the Instagrams, it's hard because our attention spans are being shortened mm-hmm. by the media that we consume. Yeah, they want to give you the, here's the 10 second sound bite. And if they can chop that down to five, they oh, will. Oh, they will, they will. Because they know they can hook you. Yep. And that's why I, I don't want tic, I don't like TikTok because it is just those short little, here, I'm going to yep. just keep bursting and slamming you with yeah. stuff over and over and over and over. Yeah. So my encouragement to you as, as listeners is um, if audiobooks are your speed, do it. Yes. If 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 books reading books is your speed, do it. Mm-hmm. But don't ever. And this is the one thing I will always I will never tell you how to live your life, but this is the one moment where I will. Don't ever stop learning, don't ever stop reading, and don't ever stop expanding what your mind is capable of engaging with. Yes, exactly. Because there's such a big world out there. The world is big and magnificent and it's full of ideas and beliefs and thoughts and perspectives. And we should never limit ourselves to what we think is the right 
or the wrong or the indifferent. Mm -hmm. There you have it. All right. Well, we've hit the hour 12, however long this has been. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to have to just cover more of the book while we talk about the movies. <laughs> I think so. I think what we'll... Because uh, we went off the rails there. Sorry, folks. But I mean, um, we'll get back I to it. I feel like that's Dune my is a big deep... <laughs> Deep we all share blame for this. Dig through, but we ha so. like there's stuff to like. Here's the thing: literature should be talked about. Mm -hmm. The interest in reading should be talked about. Yeah. There's there's a young lady on Twitter who for a long time was a um, a book activist, still is, but she's doing more of kind of like ballet and, and more artistic expression. Um, she's been to the National Council of Teachers of English conference several years running. I've met her both times, um, several times actually there. And what I get a kick about her is, is that she champions the don't, you know, keep reading, keep learning, yep. keep checking out stuff. Um, her name is Olivia uh, Van, and I can't pronounce her last name because I'm terrible, uh, but she's on Twitter at, at the live bits. Um, and she has got just an incredible passion for reading and an incredible passion for the world of exploration. She's a big shark fan. She loves learning about sharks. She, nice. she's, she's a shark fanatic. Um, she talks about how much she loves them and how cool they are and how we shouldn't be fearing them and all this other stuff. Yeah. So we can also find out what kind of judgment, judgmental looks I'm going to get when I also say I've read, I think, almost all of the John Grisham books. Wow. Through 2012. Dang. The look By of, the way, the look John Grisham, John Grisham is a is a law writer, uh -huh. and if you're not interested in law i would still recommend picking up a couple of his books one yeah. of them being the client yep um is actually a super stellar book that and the firm yeah um and it's those to me are fluff yeah in that a to me is fluff. in a similar fashion Reb web griffin has written has written a lot of police story books has written a lot of special like fbi um, military books and stuff like that because of his understanding of that world and that that is very heavy in that world, but it's a lot of fun. You get to read these stories there of these go. guys who are just trying to fight the bad guys and win, and it's gritty and it's cool. So don't ever stop reading. Don't ever stop learning. Um, my name is Aaron. I'm Dallas. And I'm James. And this has been Nerds by Screenlight. Do we have any last-minute thoughts before we close out this delightful, ruminating episode? Mm, don't be afraid because fear is the mind killer. And take care of yourselves out there. Okay. What's the term? Is it Spice's Life? Is Variety is? is the Spice of Life? No, no, no. There was something with it. Oh, the spice, spice. Spice's Life? Melange is the Spice of Life, which is the name of the spice from Dune. Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Whatever your spice is, as long as it's a healthy addition into your life, continue to practice. And it's not a, a poison that'll trap you on a planet. For, right. Yeah. right. No. For Important safety tip. It'll turn if, your eyes blue. <laughs> Fear is the mind killer. That's the that's yeah. There's the, the tagline uh, from Dune that everybody knows is fear is the mind killer. <laughs> yes. Here on Nerds by Screenlight, we just give out great life advice that always comes to the filter of a book or whatever else we're studying. Don't fall into a trap by the Padishah Emperor and Baron Harkonnen <laughs> that ends up getting you killed, even though you know it's trapped, so you're stepping into it anyway because you have to. <laughs> that's the new self. Yeah, right I, in. I got a lot of this. I just, just lean right throwing in. this stuff right into. It. <laughs> that's the new title of the next self help book. Self help book coming soon to shelves at Barnes and Noble and Amazon.com. Thanks for listening to Nerds by Screenlight. We're done. <laughs> yeah, bye everybody. See y'all. Good night. The raspberry flopovers will be out in a moment. <laughs> the kitchen is closed. You've been listening to the Nerds by Screenlight podcast, presented by Create at Morgan Productions, located in Fort Morgan, Colorado, USA. For more information on our production house, other podcasts hosted here, and further details, please visit www.createatmorgan.org. You can find us on Twitter at the handle Create at Morgan. Create at Morgan is a school club at Lincoln High School, our alternative education campus in Morgan County. Our sponsor is Aaron DeLay, the language arts teacher at Lincoln. Send any feedback to a delayed teacher at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Music